Hello everyone. This will be part one of my coverage of the chapter on diversity and LGBTQIA plus um, in your, your textbook is chapter 10. Uh, my plan for the, the remainder of our, our time together is to kind of divide up these uh, portions of the chapters to kind of go with your reading. Um, I will, in most cases, be following pretty closely with the text, but um, as I usually do, I'm adding in things that I can find that are new, that are current, and will add to your experience. Um, I will apologize in advance. I don't have the best lighting in my home office. I've also got, you know, lots of interesting noise contributions. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if my dog starts barking if someone walks by, or my 17-year-old uh, has a, a, a video game related outburst. So just expect that kind of thing to happen. So first, um, and we've, we've talked about this in class, there's a lot of terminology that is new and emerging. Um, over the last decade, I, I think there's just been tremendous change in the way we're labeling and categorizing and thinking about the, the, the terrain in this area. Um, your authors talk about LGBTQIA and use those, those, that acronym to include lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning, or queer, depending on who you're talking to, intersex, asexual, or ally. So even within the current kind of definitional terrain, the acronym meanings of the letters uh, is different depending on the audience. Your authors use the term sexual orientation very specifically, and you should know out in the general public, the use of the concept sexual orientation, people use it in a lot of different ways and not always in accurate ways. You've probably noticed that in your everyday interactions with people that you know. But for, for your authors, um, sexual orientation is about who you are sexually attracted to. Um, they, they also include the idea that you're, you're classifying people based on who their general uh, focus is on in terms of their the emotional, cognitive, um, and sexual elements of attraction. Uh, it also has, you know, its fingers in self-identity, how people describe themselves, and, and how they choose to live their lives as well. The concept of heterosexuality is in terms of the person's primary sexual orientation. This is a person who is predominantly emotionally and sexually attracted to people who are of the sex that they are not. So you could use the phrase of the other sex. Um, it's but it's never quite as simple as that. Um, heterosexuality uh, can be expressed in a variety of different ways, and we'll probably hit on that idea more than once as I go through this presentation. Similarly, with homosexuality, the, the textbook kind of definition is a person whose sexual orientation is predominantly in the form of emotional and sexual attractions to people of the same sex. As I said, with heterosexuality, it's not quite as simple as that. It's not quite as clean as that um, in terms of definitions. Um, but you know, that's the definition that we work with um, in psychology. Now, I found this um, New York Times article. Um, it was written, I think it was written a couple of years ago. I'd have to fact check that. But basically, what the, the writer did, they put out a, a prompt on social media uh, sites connected to the Times, and they just gave them the prompt that I have on the screen here of I am blank, um, and had people describe themselves in terms of sexual orientation and gender identity and sex. Um, and I found the, the list pretty fascinating. Uh, it just shows how fluid are the emergence of these different categorizations and ideas is. So I'm, I'm copying and pasting here from the article. I've put the link at the bottom of the, the slide. Bisexuality, and many of you have commented in, in a perusal about what's the difference between bisexuality and pansexuality, and there are nuances there. Um, 
with bisexuality, you have emotional and sexual attractions to both sexes. Um, in some ways, that's a, you know, saying that that's a dual kind of model. Asexuality um, refers to people who don't experience attraction and arousal uh, to a partner. That doesn't mean that these are not people who have emotional attachments and connections to other people or that they never experience sexual pleasure. It's just that with a partner, that is not their, their primary mode of interaction. And in some cases, it, it's marked by a, a preference for not having sexual encounters with another person. Pansexuality, um, how that tends to be defined by people. So this is not by scientists, this is by people. Um, it, it's typically defined in terms of being attracted to people and their gender identity or their sexual identity is not particularly relevant. And it's, it's mostly focused on that gender identity piece. So you're attracted to the person, to the human and who they are. And, and they, it's not restricted in terms of um, the person's particular gender identity. Now in this, uh, this newspaper piece, there are all of these others, these other kinds of classifications that people used to describe themselves. So an emerging term of demisexual, um, another uh, emerging term, gray sexual. Um, cisgender is a term that's really taken hold that's being used much, much more often in the last few years by people in their regular speech. Same with transgender um, and transgendered, uh, even though uh, as the writer of the New York Times article put it, that's not a word. I'm not sure that it's not a word because people are using it often. Um, using the, the word trans or with an asterisk or trans plus has been emerging on uh, social media fairly often and in people's communications with each other. Um, they tend to be used as broad terms, kind of analogous to the way the word queer is used, uh, but to talk about people who are not cisgender. Um, I've noticed in um, my high school uh, daughter's uh, circle of friends, they use the word trans in that way, whether or not they put the punctuation mark with it. Um, another couple of um, uh, emerging terms, gender nonconforming and non-binary, are, are relatively recent uh, terms to go out into the, the public conversation space. Um, and the definitions of these are really fluid. They change a lot um, and people take them very seriously. Uh, if you describe yourself as non-binary, um, it's just as, as real and just as important as describing yourself, say, as trans or describing yourself as gay or lesbian. Um, but the, the specific definitional qualities of concepts like gender nonconforming and non-binary are really kind of loose right now um, and they're they're changing pretty rapid as your generation continues to sort out how you want to use those terms. Now with with all things linguistic, um, it, the idea and the thing that fascinates me about all of these terms is that it, it's the primary way that we as a culture are kind of redefining the the terrain of gender identity and sexual identity and the intersections among them. The article concludes with um, a, a set of even more specific or sometimes more general concepts. So things like gender queer, I've heard that for probably the last uh, four or five years, pretty commonly used on, on social media, being used to describe someone who is outside of that uh, kind of traditional male female binary and who exhibits um, both masculine and feminine qualities um, in a pretty flexible way. Um, I have seen some tendency with the term gender queer to, to also kind of wrap in some elements of trans life and some elements of LGBT life as well. So it, it's one of those terms that really means different things to different people. Same with gender fluid, which is a little newer concept. Um, 
and people are using it very different ways. So the way individuals use the concept of gender fluid, it could be as I've, I've copied here from the New York Times um, article where you have people whose identity shifts or fluctuates. That was the most common way that the term was used in their very non-scientific polling of people. Um, gender neutral is another uh, concept that is is often kind of mixed with gender fluid and with non-binary, um, but means something different to different people. Um, and then you have to add uh, a, a bunch of acronyms that are often used to um, help specify trans identity. So male assigned at birth, female assigned at birth, and so on, um, as being very hyper-specific about what your your particular either sexual identity or sexual orientation or gender identity might be. Um, intersex is a concept that is used to describe fairly specific biological conditions that people may have that alter their, their physical appearance um, and can lead to um, confusions in how we assign uh, a person's uh, sexual identity at at birth or even later when the secondary sex characteristics either kick in or don't as the case may be so lots of lots and lots and lots of terminology um, it will be interesting for you know as a psychologist I get really fascinated by how things change over time but it'll be interesting to see how as um, time passes on how we continue to refine and rethink these various concepts and labels. Uh, some we will find continue to be useful and remain fairly permanent. Others may be discarded or redefined over time. So the, the next section in your chapter, and I'm not going to spend much time on, on these. Um, they're very well explained in your chapter. You talk about a variety of control models that have been used over the, the decades um, of human sexuality research to try and understand where sexuality or, or where, um, sorry, where sexual orientation comes from. So there was a lot of focus um, in the history of this field on trying to figure out what is the thing or the combination of things that causes someone to either be heterosexual or not. So a lot of this research tended to be pretty dualistic. You're either straight or you're not. So you're either heterosexual or something else. And a lot of research was invested in what causes people to not be heterosexual. Um, and you can see the logical flaws there and the problematic ways in which that would look from today's point of view. Um, but you know, that is what it is. So let's spend a little time talking about what were some of these conceptual models and um, think about some of their pros and cons. You know, we have tended, as I just said, to be kind of stuck in a dichotomous model, um, an either or model. You're either straight or you're not. Um, you're either male or you're female. Um, in terms of gender, you're either masculine or you're feminine. And that's a, that dichotomous model is really hard to break out of. Um, even though it is hopelessly limited in terms of what it can give us. And I think your generation has made that painfully clear to all of us. Now, you could also use a continuum model that has one dimension. This is also limited because what you have is you can put sexual orientation on this scale that has two ends. And you could have someone who is um, exclusively homosexual on one end and exclusively homosexual on the other end, and then in the middle is bisexuality. Now, I think we can all agree that's pretty limiting, and it doesn't include all of the diversity that we just talked about from the New York Times piece on how people identify themselves. So it suggests that, you know, what well, one of the benefits of the dimensional approach is you can have people kind of moving in, in anywhere on that continuum instead of having them in boxes. So that's the advantage. The disadvantage is that human sexuality isn't one dimensional and neither is even a component of human sexuality. The sexual orientation is not one dimensional as well. 
So some propose what's called a multidimensional model, where sexual orientation includes a variety of different components, emotions, lifestyle, um, how you identify yourself, who you're attracted to and under what circumstances, your fantasy life and what kind of themes emerge there. Um, and then, you know, obviously your actual behavior because behavior is behavior. Orientation is orientation. The two need not be consistent with each other. You may behave in one way, but your sexual orientation is another. Or sometimes you behave in a way consistent with your orientation and other times you do. Um, so that multidimensional model is historically more recent. You know, we have tended to stick with the dichotomous model. It's the thing that we're most familiar with. The interdimensional model um, is an addition to that, but it still has limitations. The multidimensional model is seen by some as having the advantage of um, acknowledging the complexity of human sexuality in terms of sexual orientation. Now we have a similar challenge when we talk about various theoretical perspectives for explaining um, sexual orientation. You know, historically the models have been dichotomous. Many of them have been really entrenched in the language of clinical psychology, which tended to pathologize homosexuality and bisexuality as either overt forms of mental illness or at the very least, as immature or pathological forms of development. So historically, we have to kind of look at you know, where we've been in terms of how we've thought about as psychologists, as uh, theorists about sexual orientation. And unfortunately, we've tended not to look at sexual orientation um, in, in a way that is particularly positive historically. So many theories imply that uh, if you're not heterosexual, that there's something, there's pathology afoot. Um, and there have been a variety of ther theories for trying to explain that. Um, there are also questions of nature versus nurture. In some cases, theorists, um, particularly those coming from a biological standpoint or a physiological standpoint, they argue that there must be some, you know, nature or biological um, flaw or thing that has happened that has caused um, a non-heterosexual outcome, then there are those who, who lean on the, the nurture side, uh, more from psychological theory, who suggest that something in that person's environment happened that caused them to deviate from normal development. Now, at, this, at the current point in time, um, most psychologists that you ask are going to agree that uh, sexual orientation as it is expressed by humans, it is a complicated interaction of both biological and sociocultural factors. So here I'm trying to choose my words very, very carefully. Um, when, when I say that sexual, sexual orientation as it is expressed, what I'm saying is the, the biological components kind of are consistent with the prevailing idea that people are born with their sexual orientation. However, they're born into a world that has different expectations and understandings of that phenomenon. So this interactive model tends to lean in the direction of saying people are born with their, their solid predisposition toward a sexual orientation of a particular kind the world then has influence on specifically how that orientation is expressed, whether you're allowed to express it publicly, um, the degree of support that you get for pursuing your relationships as your, your biology intends, and so on. So when, I, when this bullet point, your authors, when they say, most agree there's an interaction of biology and sociocultural factors, that's what they're talking about. Um, it's not quite as simple as saying, can you learn to be gay or something like that? It, it's more that there's this mixture of influences um, at all levels of our, our existence. Now, right now, um, most of the research that's been done, <clears throat> excuse me, 
uh, to look at origins or causal theories of sexual orientation has looked at um, gay men and lesbian women. There's been precious little research on bisexuality and even less on pansexuality and asexuality. Although some of that research is starting to be conducted um, and has been ongoing in recent years, most of what we have is about gay men, um, somewhat less about lesbian women. Um, you know, some of this research was coming out, um, not to drag you back into the ancient past, but um, I can remember distinctly when I was in college that there were there was lots of conversation about a quote unquote gay gene. So during the 1980s, there was some research trying to find are there genetic predictors in the human genome that suggest that there are um, genes that make it um, more likely that a person would be um, gay uh, or lesbian. And that research, you know, was really double edged and controversial. It wasn't universally seen as a positive thing among um, gays and lesbians. You know, you have the idea of, oh, yeah, if we found a gene that that would, you know, mean I was really born this way and people would have to accept me. At the same time, if there is a gene, does that mean that parents might test for it and abort their gay children? So it was a really uh, controversial time when people were looking at that. Um, so, you know, I think it's helpful for you to put that back in your head. Now, there are a number of different biological explanations that have been proposed. Um, research in this area is very challenging, and it's, it's often based on animal models as opposed to human models, because doing experimental research on humans uh, where you are systematically manipulating biological variables is obviously unethical. So um, we, we often rely on animal models, and they're not perfect. So if you're studying mice and rats, for example, um, and then trying to decide if I expose um, in utero mice to certain hormonal manipulations and then their sexual behavior is changed, does that mean the same kind of phenomenon would occur in humans? Well, it may or may not. We're not mice. We're complicated uh, in ways that mice are not. Mice have certain instinctive patterns of behaviors that we don't, and so on. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. There have been, as I was mentioning on the previous slide, uh, some genetic theories. Um, to date, we don't have a lot of solid information to say to us this set of genes is likely involved in, say, homosexuality or bisexuality. Um, there, there were some, some ideas, but in all likelihood, the genetic story behind sexual orientation is, is likely to be very, very complex. By that, I mean there are probably multiple genes and probably even more likely multiple chromosomes involved. There have been many theories that are um, based on prenatal hormonal exposure. Um, and again, mixed results. Um, there, there's more evidence to show effects of prenatal hormones in terms of physicality and um, a variety of other uh, kind of obviously seen or observed variables. It's harder to connect specific kinds of prenatal exposure to the expression of sexual orientation. Um, as I mentioned previously, a lot of the prenatal hormonal exposure research is based on animal models. So they're, they're really tricky to apply to human patterns of behavior. Um, another kind of theory is after puberty, or there are hormonal theories to that are uh, that suggest that say you have a male who is exposed to is underexposed to testosterone or theoretically overexposed to estrogens would that person be more likely to express um, uh, interest in the same sex same for um, women attracted to women the theory would be if women were overexposed to testosterone would they be more likely to be attracted to women um, to date, there's not a lot of support for that idea. Um, certainly in people who are trans, who are, um, say if you have a, a person born male at birth, 
um, and they transition to female, they will um, often use hormonal manipulation mostly to change their physicality, um, not so much their, their, their sexual orientation. And in fact, some, some of the, what little research we have for people who are trans, when they go through hormonal treatment, their sexual, their sexual orientation doesn't change. So if prior to transition they were attracted to men, they continue to be attracted to men. If they're, they were attracted to women, they continue to be attracted to women. If they were attracted to both, yada, yada. Um, so there hasn't been a lot of um, really confirmatory findings to suggest that the hormonal exposure post-puberty can um, affect sexual orientation. Now, like biological theories, there have been a variety of sociocultural theories um, proposed for explaining how um, specifically homosexuality and bisexuality occur. And, and as I previously said, most of the research is on uh, gay men and lesbians. So sexual, sexual orientation, um, you could theoretically argue that peer groups, parents, media exposure and other socializing elements could be theorized as a causal factor predicting sexual orientation and you know often this is in the form of if the media shows lots of images of people who are engaging in gay sex then people will become interested in and attracted to that or if a person's peer group is um, gay or lesbian that they will become uh, quote unquote converted to that lifestyle. Um, there have been a lot of theories about parent-child interactions. That goes all the way back to the Freudian theory. You know, Freud, um, in some uh, cases, talked about the emergence of homosexuality as a result of failed developmental interactions between parents and children during the, um, the phallic stage of development. So it, in specifically a failure of the Oedipal and quote unquote electoral complexes um, where the child has failed in appropriately identifying with the opposite sex parent. Um, there are some, some theories that for want of a better term called sexual interaction theories, which basically propose that if you have a gay experience, you have a same sex experience, that could lead you in the direction of um, having that more. Now, some of these theories focus on sexual abuse. So if a person is abused by a same sex person, um, if they're you know, molested or, or otherwise assaulted by um, a same sex person, that it would increase the likelihood that the victim of such an assault will, would exhibit homosexuality. Um, to date, you know, if we look at these three bullet points, we don't have good evidence that any of these kinds of experiences cause people to acquire uh, a different sexual orientation. You know, it, the, the evidence just isn't there, particularly this, the, the idea, the theory that people who are sexually abused by a same-sex person will somehow be converted to being, um, homosexual. Now, one of the unfortunate um, outgrowths of causal theories that suggest that you can learn to be, um, that you can acquire your sexual orientation by learning is something called conversion therapy. And, you know, a lot of psychologists, uh, you know, find the just the idea of conversion therapy absolutely absurd and horrifying but i want to drag you back in historical time just so that you understand the context of where this came from um you know psychology uh, has has an unfortunate history a, a disturbing history when it comes to lgbtq people um, the, the norm, the dominant theory was that heterosexuality was normal and anything else was abnormal. And, you know, from the, the inception of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the earliest versions, homosexuality in any form was considered pathological. It was considered to be a psychological disorder. 
So if it's a disorder, there should be a therapy for it. Um, from the Freudian standpoint, it meant digging around in the, the person's historical past and finding out you know, what was flawed in that person's development that led them to have this inappropriate attraction to people of the same sex, for example, or, or people of more than one sex in the case of bisexuality. Um, conversion therapy is just an extreme version of using a mixture of, bio, of um, behavioral and cognitive techniques to try and convert people from being oriented um, either as homosexual or bisexual uh, to being oriented towards what is perceived to be a more appropriate target of one's um, sexual attraction. Um, for gays and lesbians, uh, for trans people, for you know the whole uh, LGBTQ diaspora, the history of conversion therapy is a really horrifying one um, because basically you're being uh, told that number one, the things that you feel in terms of your attraction to other people are not valid, and number two, that you're sick, and number three, you need to stop feeling that way and being who you're being. So conversion therapy is designed to alter a person's sexual orientation. Um, in some cases, as your authors note, it's called reparative therapy. And think about that word, reparative. It's based on repair. So the assumption is something went wrong and got broken in the person, and it needs to be fixed so that you can live an appropriate heterosexual lifestyle. Um, I include this little infographic that I found from the UCLA School of Law, um, which indicated that at the time they collected the data, there were close to 700,000 LGBTQ plus adults that had been um, treated using conversion therapies. And this, this number, 350,000 of those were adolescents. So you're talking about people who are not adults, who are not capable of you know, defending themselves in a legal sense as individuals. Those decisions were made by adults in those in their lives um, at the time when they were basically children, um, when they were adolescents. Um, 57,000 of those, um, that's the estimated number of youth receiving conversion therapy before they reached the age of 18. Um, and um, at the time UCLA did their research, only 18 states had legally banned their the use of conversion therapies. Now, the APA, the American Psychological Association, has had a statement on this issue for quite some time. Um, although, if you put it in the longer course of history, it should have happened a lot earlier. Um, just as uh, removing homosexuality from the DSM as a disorder should have happened a lot earlier. Um, but, you know, there it is. So here's a graphic of kind of where states are um, that I found um, where you have in the darkest colored states are the states where um, there's a ban for conversion therapy for minors. That's 19 states. Then the, the hash mark state is uh, North Carolina which has a partial ban on conversion therapy for minors. Um, the big chunk are these light colored states. The light colored states are those in which there is no ban at all. Um, and notice, you know, the focus so far in legislative efforts, which you can see those legislative efforts have been the strongest in the, in the East and the Upper East Coast um, and on the West Coast and to some extent in the Central West. Um, the weakest across the South and, and the Midwest. Um, so we have quite a, a territory to cover. So I'm going to uh, conclude um, part one of chapter 10 here with a brief conversation about coming out and concealment. Um, there has been a fair amount of research on the process and the experience of coming out. And a lot of that research has been um, qualitative in nature, focused on how people tell their stories, and it can be really fascinating research to read about. So I encourage you to do that if you're interested in the, the, the nature of the coming out process. Um, just so we're all in agreement on terminology, 
And and some of you, you were mentioning in your, your conversations, either on perusal or in the discussion forum, um, about how, why is it that heterosexual people don't come out? Well, in, in our culture, being heterosexual is still perceived as the norm. Um, and it's statistically normative. It's also culturally seen as normative. Um, so we haven't had the same kind of necessity uh, at this point for, for coming out. So coming out refers to uh, the old term of coming out of the closet, which is the opposite of being in the closet. And basically it's a process of identifying both self and then presenting that identification to others and disclosing it to the key people in your lives. Um, I've sometimes seen this described as concentric circles. You know, it starts with the self-identification in the middle of the circle, and then the closest people, and then another ring of closeness, and then a farther out ring of closeness, and a farther out, and eventually being fully out. Now, recognize that people live anywhere on that continuum of quote unquote outness. I don't know if that's an appropriate term, but there you go. Um, but it is it is a process and people have to decide for themselves to whom and under what circumstances they want to be out. Um, still today, there are some places where it's simply safer to not be out. Um, and uh, given the, the degree of discrimination that people who are LGBTQIA still face, those are decisions that are, are taken very seriously by those in that community. And people who are heterosexual just don't have to deal with that. Um, so some people may deliberately conceal um, their, their sexual orientation, um, and sometimes for very practical purposes uh, of maintaining their safety, maintaining their privacy, and protecting the people um, who are close to them. Um, in some cases, people choose a very strategic non-disclosure, so they may be open in some contexts, but very closed in others. And in some cases, this is just a, you know, a very strategic attempt to um, control who might be a potential person who would discriminate against you or harm you. In other cases, it's just, I'm a private person. I don't discuss my sexual orientation with people who I work with, but I'm open or out in other contexts. So there's a, a subtle difference between concealment which is deliberately hiding or misrepresenting your sexual orientation, such as, you know, people um, still in some cases will pass in the workplace or in the public sphere, um, pretending to be heterosexual, for example. Um, and sometimes that's quite elaborate, but in other situations being quite open. The non-disclosure doesn't really include that very, very deliberate attempt at concealing one's sexual orientation. In contrast, non-disclosure is you just you, you're careful. You you disclose in some contexts with people who are safe, and not in others where it's just simply not necessary. So that's the end of part one of chapter ten. Um, I look forward to seeing you again with part two.